Hello and welcome to Bread Theory. I am Zach. I am your chill companion through the world of leftist literature. And uh, tonight we're going to be covering the final part uh, of the final chapter of The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin, one of the foundational texts of anarchist com uh, anarcho-communist uh, thought and philosophy. And uh, my guest tonight is going to be Matthew Stevens. Uh, I think he's running a little bit late right now, um, so he'll be joining up uh, as, as soon as he is able. Uh, but for now, um, I think we're going to uh, get on with uh, the program pretty quickly here. I uh, just did want to mention also, um, as you can see behind me, if you're used to uh, my, my wall of, of luscious vegetation that, that usually provides uh, the backdrop, uh, so if you're used to that, that, that wall of, of jungle, basically, uh, I've, I've moved my computer into my bedroom to um, uh, hopefully control the sound a little better. For one thing, we have, I have some curtains on these windows, and um, that should absorb the sound a little more. And then also it, it gives my wife some space where she doesn't feel she has to be huddled in the bedroom when I'm doing my streams. Um, so it's kind of it's kind of cozier here uh, as well. I've, I <laughs> I've been uh, kind of toying with the idea of, of referring to it as, as the bread box, uh, but that might be a little bit too on the nose. So uh, you'll, you'll have to tell me in the comments, uh, however you find this this video or this audio, uh, what you think about uh, that name. But at least I, I got a few plants behind me still. Um, up on our shelves there, we have a, a, this one. Oops, sorry, wrong side. I got to get used to that, that camera thing. So right there, that one hanging right there, uh, that's what's known as, as a kokodama style planting. So so it's pretty cool. So that, that plant itself is a fern. It's a type of fern. I don't know which type offhand. Uh, but, but regardless, what you do is you take um, this mat, basically. It's, it's like this artificial, I don't know if it's felt or what it is, but, but it has... Uh, pieces of moss glued to it so and then and then it's kind of dyed a little bit green uh, and then you basically wrap it around the the root ball of the plant so you have dirt and and the roots all in there and that kind of acts as a container and then you kind of hang it up it's supposed to create the illusion that it's kind of like a floating island usually use a uh, fishing line but we didn't have any on hand so we just used wire but i think i think the effect is still kind of nice um and then we got a few more oh sorry <laughs> Gotta get used to that. A few more plants on the, on the shelves there. Uh, so at least we have a little bit of vegetation, a little bit of, of nature in here with us in this new setting. Uh, so I'm excited about that and excited to know what you guys think about uh, my new surroundings and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but anyway, let's get into the, the, the book tonight. So we have come a very long way. This, is, this has been, oh gosh, at least... I would say 18 weeks, maybe 19 weeks at this point, because I think there is at least one more chapter that was a two-parter, and this is, this is the end of chapter 17. So it's at least 18 weeks, if not 19 or more, that we've been doing this. And also, there's been a, a week or two where I've taken off, so total time. We've been doing this a while. This, is, this has taken most of, of, of this year, most of 2021 so far, has been devoted to this particular book. So it's kind of it's kind of exciting to to finally come to the conclusion after all this time after all the, the guests that I've had on. Thank you again to to all the the amazing guests that that I've had on. Um, everyone has brought something unique and, and special in their perspective uh, to the the material. You've all been a, just a tremendous help in in helping really shape the direction of of this stream. And, and also uh, as, a, as a podcast and a YouTube channel as well. Uh, you know, I was, I was kind of searching around a, a little bit at the beginning there when I was, when I was trying to do gaming at the same time as doing uh, the, the audiobooks, which, you know, maybe I'll get back to that at some point. But for now, I just found a whole lot more uh, fulfillment from, from having a guest on that I can, like, you know, bounce ideas off who can who can bring their own perspectives. Like I've come to think of things in, in much different ways than I otherwise would have if I was just doing this solo and um, and not having a guest on to riff on these these topics with me. So yeah, this is this has been great. I I, I really feel like I've I've found my niche, um, and then I've expanded out into doing these the Sunday streams as well. So uh, look for that coming up this Sunday. I think I'm going to be doing part three of 
my intro to permaculture uh, series of videos. And I've, I've really enjoyed doing those a lot lately. Um, and then who knows? Who knows what we'll, where the, the Sunday fun day will take us from that point. You know, if you have any suggestions of sorts of videos or topics you'd like covered, um, I've, I've kind of thrown the idea around in my head of perhaps looking into some right literature, um, particularly bad stuff like Ayn Rand and stuff like that, and, and doing like a hate read stream. Um, I thought that might be kind of interesting. I could, I could get some good entertainment value out of that because, boy, is that a bad book? <laughs> Just in every sense of the word. Um, and, and, you know, I wouldn't, probably wouldn't read every single page because especially that book is, is quite repetitive in its ideas. Um, but maybe just skip to like the, the, the end big radio speech. Cause that, that kind of contains all of the various Randian philosophies all, all mashed together in one big blob of contradictory BS basically, uh, that boils down to, uh, capitalists are, are the great men of history and they're just so much bigger brain than everyone else that, that we should just worship at their feet and, and be happy they toss us any crumbs at all. And if you want to be like them, well, you have to work hard and prove your worth. Um, and then you'll be recognized and, and uh, ordained in the, the, the church of, of um, great industrialists, basically. Um, yeah, that's... It's... It's a really bad book. It took me so long to get through that one in particular. Um, but there's, there's plenty of other terrible rightist uh, reading out there. Uh, I could do like The Road to Serfdom by um, F.A. F. Hayek. I think that was his name. Hayek was his last name anyway. I don't remember his initials specifically. I think it was F.A. though. That's another really terrible one that just somehow deems everything authoritarian except the capitalist framework where you have a, a boss who, or an owner, I should say, of a company that can make all the financial and, and business arrangement decisions just autocratically. That's somehow not authoritarian. <laughs> uh, hello to Tribunus Plebis, uh, Plebis, excuse me. The, the Tribunus uh, Plebis podcast is, is way, yeah, I know Hayek is, is terrible. I screamed through that entire audiobook as well. It's just like, what about capitalism? It's like, come on on man how can you be so blinded by this 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 light that you see of of the perfectly free market ah um and and you know of course through the entire book they very poorly define what what socialism is it's it's basically the government doing stuff and owning things as as richard wolf likes to to put the the bad take of the the right-leaning people uh, that they have towards socialism but uh, I digress. Those, those are just some ideas where we're going to go. Our next book that we're going to cover uh, on the next Friday stream is going to be uh, the Principles of Communism. So I like, to, I like to switch back and forth between anarchism and communism to explore. Uh, explore. And, you know, I could do general leftism and, and socialism as well. Uh, but anyway, I like to kind of switch it off, at least between anarch anarchism and, and communism to explore various uh, perspectives in leftist thought. Because the way I see it, I think there is a real case to be made for uh, leftist unity in that the end state of society is is basically the same when you talk to the, the bulk of, of either communists or anarchists. It's, it's getting to a society where there's no unjust hierarchies, where everyone gets the basics of... Uh, sustaining life just by just by being alive and they they contribute what they can uh, and and if that's if that's not much of anything that people consider productive so be it but but still they 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 do whatever they can and and they get whatever they need you know it's a, it's a need-based economy um, and both believe in in getting to a, a stateless and moneyless society eventually uh, so I think it's important to look at it from from both sides I'm very I'm, I'm somewhat centrist on, on anarcho versus uh, communist, um, although I definitely lean towards anarchist, but, but that's beside the point. Anyway, Principles of Communism by, by uh, Friedrich Engels, one of, one of the, the two authors of the Communist Manifesto, less, less often mentioned. I don't really know why. I don't know why he gets such short shrift. Perhaps it's just because 
uh, Marx ended up with his magnum opus being Capital, and and that just kind of overshadowed everything that Engels did. He did a lot. Of, Engels did a lot of really great works as well, uh, which we will get to at some point as well. Um, so anyway, yeah, look forward to the principles of communism next week, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time here on this channel. Uh, but tonight, let's let's finish that up. So yeah, enough gabbing. If if uh, Matthew's able to join, we'll just we'll just patch him in as we go. And otherwise, I, I welcome your questions or, or thoughts as we get through this second half of the agriculture chapter in um, the conquest of bread. Um, I'm liking this one, this chapter in particular, more than the one that preceded it because, boy, I I I still feel bad that that. Uh, <laughs> I had to subject my, my former guest, uh, Bree, to that just listing of different types of industries and how they have expanded. That, that was the, most of the, the chapter uh, 16. Uh, very dry and not very applicable to today, although we somehow spun it into a, a two-hour conversation. Uh, so anyway, yeah. Anyway, I, I keep saying we're going to get to it, but now we're really going to get to it. Uh, so here we go with chapter 17 of the conquest of bread on agriculture and this is this is uh part two in in our particular series it's not part two in the chapter itself so there'll uh, be some discrepancy between that but we're, we're picking up right where we left off on the last episode so here we go and please uh, any questions you have anything you want to bring up that's related to what we're talking about more than welcome please do work well, then, to give bread and meat to all, it would need only seventeen half days of work a year per man. Add three million work days, or double that number if you like, in order to obtain milk. That will make twenty-five work days of five hours in all, nothing more than a little pleasurable country exercise to obtain the three principal products, bread, meat, and milk. The three products which, after housing, cause daily anxiety to nine-tenths of mankind. And yet, let us not tire of repeating. These are not fancy dreams. We have only told what is, what Ben obtained by experience on a large scale. Agriculture could be reorganized in this way. So to, to refresh your memory on, on what Kropotkin is going on about right now, basically he is saying, and he's bringing in, he's trying to tie together all his ideas from the previous chapters. Um, and what he's saying is that if we take out an owner taking their cut without actually pr necessarily producing anything of their own, um, but just by virtue of being an owner, getting to take what they what they will. Uh, and then if we take out overproduction due to uh, just market forces, if instead we're going by a needs-based economy and we calculate how much of a particular product the, the populace needs in, in a given year, and we, we try to match our production to that. So if we do those two things, uh, and then also if, if we unleash the power of creativity and agency um, on the, the workers who are now worker owners of whatever uh, project they're engaged in, whatever sort of production they're engaged in, all these factors combine to, to in his estimation, needing a lot less work in a, in a day. Um, I, I think he just said uh, about five hours of work um, to to produce uh, per day to produce the the the, the three main staples um, of his time, and that seems like a pretty good promise. Like like not only are you more in control of your life, uh, not only do you have control over the thing that that dominates your life the most, which is your your place of work, the thing that you spend likely the most of your waking hours at um, and that you depend on more than anything else for your sustenance and for your survival. Um, so not only are you having more agency and more freedom in that, but you're also working less at the same time. Like it's, it's a win, win, win. I mean, the wins pile on top of each other. And, and, and all of this also ties into his idea that lasting, endurable, or, or enduring, um, resilient, you know, uh, resistant to, to shocks, uh, revolutions are, are not in the overthrowing of, of whoever's in power, but in fulfilling the promise of the revolution. 
So, so in, you invest the revolution in the revolutionaries, the people that, that help you bring about this new world. Um, and, and that more than any central, uh, centralized government or bureaucracy, that is going to guard against people destroying the gains of the revolution and destroying the revolution itself, putting things back to, to where they were. Because people will feel so empowered and they will be so grateful to have this new life and these new possibilities at their fingertips that they're not just going to suffer some tyrant coming in and trying to woo them with this or that. You know, as long as you can keep production going and, and, and meeting the basic needs of, of people's lives, then you can keep the entire revolution rolling along and, and um, guard against any sort of, of, of future failure. All right, so Sean of, of Tribunus Plebis is saying, I like that he points out several times that these are not fanciful dreams, but rather fully within reach. I agree with that. I'll, you know, one of the main criticisms of Kropotkin is, is that he's very, he's overly optimistic in thinking that, well, I mean, if you want to be really cynical, that people would just work if they're not being forced to. If it's not, you know, work or starve, uh, then then how are you going to motivate people? Like that's that's always the charge of today's uh, captains of industry and, and, and big business types and even small business types. Well, we'll probably be on board with that sort of thinking, which is kind of bizarre considering how little work owners tend to do. Um or at least how much control they have over how much work they do. Like, like literally, name an owner of a company. They, they, they legally own the products of production. They may have a contract with you, so they may owe you a, a portion of that. But beyond whatever contract they have with you as a worker, they can do with it what they like. They don't have to lift a finger. Um, and yet, they're always, at the same time, they're always being praised for, for how hardworking they are. Well, I mean, they don't have to work. They could just sit back and collect. I mean, look at landlords, people that... Now, I'm not talking about property management companies. I'm talking about actual owners of property, of rental properties. How much work do they tend to do? I, I'm, I'm guessing that, that if you've rented at all, you may not have even ever seen the person who literally owns your building. You may have seen their representatives that they hire, their, their, their property management companies, but... They may live in another state. How much work could they be doing towards, you know, your building if they're not even ever on the property? Um, and yet they, they, they continue on. They, they continue to be upheld as, as, you know, important members of society and stuff like that. It's kind of a bizarre way of thinking because you see that people do continue to work um, even when they're owners. They, they do tend to work some and some very hard. Uh, there's, there's definitely, I mean, there, there's probably some, some, you know, standard deviation, like bell shaped curve distribution of, of, uh, workers who are owners who also are workers in their own businesses. Um, and I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if it lines up pretty well with, with, uh, just people's natural inclinations. Um, so, so the idea that, 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 you know, people wouldn't work if they if they weren't motivated by hunger or, or extreme poverty or, or exposure to the elements or any of these sorts of things. It just it doesn't make sense. How could we have gotten to this point in civilization if if that were true? I mean, entire societies are just being cudgeled along by by the the, the smart and the, and the the uh, industrious. I don't I don't think so. I don't buy that at all. So there's so so I mean there's one charge down which which I can't even uh, really entertain all that much. Um, so they also say that you have to build this this strong central um, organization, this bureaucracy, in order to fight off, you know, the capitalists who are still going to be around to some degree. Uh, that the former business owners will still be around after a revolution. I mean, you you, you might. Uh, I mean, there've been revolutions where they have beheaded as many as, as they can get their hands on, but but even still, they they have considerable resources at their disposal. They can they can go into hiding. They can they can muster forces against uh, people that would do them harm in any way, um, or they can just you know flee the country. Um, 
probably more often than not, that's that's what they would tend to do. Uh, that that's come up a lot lately with with what's happening in Cuba um, and and talking about the the so-called G slur, uh, referring to Cuban capitalists that that fled their country um, during Castro's revolution and and now are you know are the are the first to speak out against communism and its evils and all this stuff. Uh, there's there's a word which, you know, I, I'm not gonna say it, um, but it means worm in Spanish, and it's it's what Castro, as as well as I understand other revolutionaries, use to refer to people that are that just flee. You know, these rich people that just get out because they can, because they don't want to be part of a a more egalitarian society and have any of their riches taken from them and redistributed to uh, people who deserve them, which is everybody. Everybody deserves, you know, to live, to have a, 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 a comfortable life. Um, so, yeah, so there's there's a word that begins with G. I'm sure you can look it up. But um, there's there's been debate about whether or not that's a, that's a slur. Um, so anyway, it's so, a uh, big digression there. But the, the, the central point was was talking about how people say, well, you need to have this strong centralized government to guard against these sorts of, of you know, people that would launch a counter-revolution from within, and then also uh, opportunist armies from without that might come and, and try to take advantage of the upheaval in society and, and the, the breakdown of the power structure and take you over. And, and so Kropotkin is, is charged as, as being too optimistic in, in his idea that, that, that people will just self-organize and keep the revolution going and, and this new society going. Um, but I don't think it's that unrealistic, because if, if you really are liberating people, uh, perhaps for the first time in their life, they, they will they will finally have uh, as as much say as anyone could ever have in their lives and 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 in their pursuits, um, in in what they do for a living, if if they choose to do anything. Um, and then never have the threat of starvation or, or um, exposure uh, put upon them in order to get them to do one thing or another. The, these people, I, I, I think for if you are liberating thousands or tens of thousands or millions of minds and, 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 and people all at the same time, I, I think that's pretty re- resilient if you can pull it off. If you can keep that that uh, bureaucracy from creeping in, as soon as as you know the tyrants fall, but as as long as I think you lay the foundation early on, um, and have people thinking in in a manner of of uh, that this book lays out, and and thinking that they're going to be reaching towards that goal, I I think you stand a, a much better chance of of, of guarding those promises. Uh, those revolutionary promises of equality, freedom, democracy, and uh, so on and so forth, um, liberation. Um, so, so I, I don't see that at all as as unrealistic. So I think that's a good point there, Sean. Uh, so, so Sean continues, uh, Tribunus Plebis continues um, by saying, it's important, I think, not to let this stuff become some weird, unattainable utopian dream. No, I, I totally agree with you, which is one reason I think it's so important to, to not just read this stuff, but really talk about it. And that, that's part of, uh, part of the service that I'm trying to provide here is, is to, to give you someone that you can talk about this stuff with, especially if you find yourself in a community that is, not too amenable to these sorts of ideas right now, um, you know, so that you have someone to go through these these older, especially these older texts, which, like like we found out in chapter sixteen, don't always relate to the modern day or are very limited in how much they they relate to the modern day. Um, just because it was it was in in many ways different material conditions at the time. So, so I think it's really important to, to have other people to, you know, sift through these, these ideas with so that you come out with a much more rich and robust understanding. I know I certainly have just through the comments that I've gotten in, in the chat 
and, and especially through the, the guests that I've had on, as I mentioned, I know that I've come out a lot better uh, with a much better understanding of all of this than, than even the first time when I, you know, went through the audiobook on my own. All kinds of ideas that didn't leap out at me then that uh, I've not had time to reflect on and now have had people to help me reflect on. And I, and I feel I'm a lot better for it. So, so that, that's what I'm trying to pass along to, to everyone who um, is within the sound of my voice or, or the, the view of my, my image, I guess. Uh, but anyway, yeah, thank you for your comment there, Sean. I think we'll, we'll continue on a little bit more in the chapter. It's way tomorrow if property laws and general ignorance did not offer opposition. The day Paris has understood that to know what you eat and how it is produced is a question of public interest. The day when everybody will have understood that this question is infinitely more important than all the parliamentary debates of the present time. I just don't, don't want to let that one little phrase slip by there, that, that it's important to know what you eat and where it comes from. I mean, that, that, that shifts perspective uh, just a little bit, that they were still concerned about, or they were, they, they were even concerned about this now almost 130 years ago that, that people were still feeling that they were disconnected from the, th the things that they ate and, and, and where they came from and they were losing that connection to the ecosystems that uh, sustain them so yeah and, and, and to, to try and bring some more permaculture ideas into that I think that's that really is where permaculture has one of its greatest strengths in, and that's reconnecting people to the natural systems of the world. Just one, one of the ethics that it espouses, uh, coming from David Holmgren, is the, the uh, principle of uh, to observe and interact. I mean, just that alone can really change uh, your framing of things, you know? Being, being deliberate in your world, um, not, just a, not just a passive, not, not just passively moving through it, uh, focused on whatever goal you are, but to, to take, some, take some time to just look around and observe what's going on around you, the natural cycles, um, the, the ecosystems that are still to one degree or another intact, even if you're in a, a large city. Um, there's still going to be birds and, and you know, m rodents, uh, bugs, uh, cats, dogs. You know, I, I, have, I have even seen a coyote within the city limits of, of St. Paul, um, just sitting on the side of, a, of an off-ramp, just, you know, kind of staring out like, you know, uh, like, like, you know, nothing could be more natural. Uh, there are now turkeys that have moved back into the cities. Um, I think even in some of the outer suburbs, people have seen bears and stuff like that. Uh, well, I guess there's nothing really else like bears, but, you know, wildlife of, of that consequence and magnitude I suppose is where I was going with that um, so yeah there are still ecosystems happening all around you uh, still still moving in their cycles of the seasons and of the days and of the weather of the climate uh, there are uh, entire generations of plants that, that live and die every year all around you and and just stopping to observe and interact can can do a lot it's, it's a big first step towards breaking that disconnect breaking the disconnection and and reconnecting you to something that was always there and something that that i mean pretty much has to always be there in order to sustain us we're not going to get by paving over the entire world um so yeah i think that's that's one of the big promises of permaculture uh, especially when you get into food production and actually not just being an observer, but now an act, you know, it's that second part, interact. That, that's part of interacting is, is growing your own food. And then there's the, and then the other principles start coming in, obtain a yield, produce no waste. You know, you start thinking about these different cycles, uh, cycles of nutrients and, and, and waste and how, you know, pretty much everything's waste is something else's nutrient. And, and just the way that that makes us all so interconnected in a really real material way 
these are the sorts of things that, that permaculture can bring into the discussion. But anyway, let's let's continue on a little more. I am on that day, the revolution will be an accomplished fact. Paris will take possession of the two departments and cultivate them. And then the Parisian worker, after having labored a third of his existence in order to buy bad and insufficient food, will produce it himself, under his walls, within the enclosure of his forts, if they still exist, and in a few hours of healthy and attractive work. And now we pass on to fruit and vegetables. Let us go outside Paris and visit the establishment of a market gardener who accomplishes wonders, ignored by learned economists, at a few miles from the academies. Let us visit, suppose, Monsieur Pons, the author of a work on market gardening, who makes no secret of what earth yields him, and who has published it all along. Monsieur Pons, and especially his workmen, work hard. It takes eight men to cultivate a plot a little less than three acres, 2.7. They work 12 and even 15 hours a day, that is to say, three times more than is needed. 24 of them would not be too many, to which Monsieur Ponce will probably answer that he pays the terrible sum of 100 pound rent a year for his 2.7 acres of land. Ah, so we're talking about getting rid of all those rent seekers. All those people that, that, that make their money just by... The happenstance that they own the land that you are, are dependent on. Why do they own it? Um, that would be an interesting book to get into uh, that, that I just thought of. Uh, that being What is Property by, by uh, oh boy, now I'm going to fumble his name, but his last name is Proudhon. He's a French guy, and it's uh, somewhat of a dry read, but it really goes through step by step. Oh, so you own this? Why do you own this? Oh, so you got it from your, your father? Well, where did he get it from? You know, and one of his basic points is that you go back far enough and you find that ownership is just a, a complete fictitious thing uh, that's come out of some great crime. So whether you've taken, whether someone way back there has just taken the land from someone else um, and perhaps in the process murdering or enslaving its, its former inhabitants, um, or, uh, you know, they, they've, they've cheated them out of it in some way. They, they've they've uh, swindled them and somehow gained it. Uh, every single piece of land was, was, was ill-gotten in some way or another, if you go back far enough. So to say, well, I mean, all of that's in the past, well, I mean, then that becomes the problem of where do you make the cutoff? Is it, is it one generation ago? So, so if... Your grandfather murders the inhabitants of a particular land and then uh, bequeaths it to uh, your father, who then bequeaths it to you in his will. Does, does that wash it enough of, of all the blood that's been spilled in order to gain that land? Does that make it legitimate now? Uh, or if it's just your father, what if your father did it and, and now you just happen to inherit it? Uh, does that make it okay now that this is stolen or swindled or, or whatever sort of land? Uh, do, do generations of, of financial transactions, you know, passing legal, le legal deed from, from hand to hand to hand, does that wash it of all the, the blood that, that at some point had to have come in order to obtain that land? Uh, probably not. And, that, and that's, that's basically the point of Proudhon. Probably not going to cover that book for quite a while just because it is so dry and it's basically just making one point that probably could be made in, in far fewer pages. But he, he just, you know, he really just meticulously lays it out why there's no such thing as legitimate private land. So, uh, you know, this, uh, it's been a while since I've read it, but I, th I think, you know, he, he came up with the he's considered the father of, of mutualism. Um, and, and part of mutualism is the idea that, that legitimate land comes from usage. So if you use the land for, and again, it's, it gets to be amorphous. How long of a period of time do you have to use the land? I don't really know. But, but still, it, the idea is that it's more legitimate to confer ownership to whoever is using a piece of property. Right? So if you, know, if you look at a factory, the workers are operating the machines. Uh, and and some management is is 
you know, assigning useful tasks and making sure that things are running in order. You have accountants that are doing support staff work as well. Uh, but basically, the people that are making the, the stuff happen are the ones that should own it. I, that, that's, that's one of the basic principles, as I understand it, of, of mutualism. Um, so yeah, interesting concepts, but uh, you know, that, that'll, that'll be for another time anyway. Um, I think we'll just we'll continue on a little bit more here. And 100 pounds for manure bought in the barracks he is obliged to exploit. He would no doubt answer, being exploited, I exploit in my turn. His installation has also cost him 1,200 pounds, of which certainly more than half went as tribute to the idle barons of industry. In reality, this establishment represents... So even rent, sink, rent seekers have to deal with other rent seekers, uh, you know, and, and again, what is the legitimacy of their claim to whatever property that, that uh, rent seeker has, that, that, that lower down rent seeker has? Probably nothing more than some legal work that was was worked out from people that at some point conquered the land, or or you know got it through through one terrible means or another, basically. Um, so so Kropotkin wants to just sweep all of that sort of business aside, and say no. You know the 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 private property, which is the the property again distinguishing it from personal property you know a, a way to think of it is toothbrush is your personal property only you need to use that no one else needs to use your toothbrush it's it's part of your hygiene which is part of you sustaining yourself uh just as a person regardless of work so no one else needs to own that that can be yours but then private property is how you make a living so it's it's the the business that you do with or without other people, um, and that sort of thing should be owned by the workers that do it, right? So, so just cut out all these middlemen, all these these rent seekers, these people that that just throw their weight around because they already happen to have money and power uh, to purchase that th those means of production in the first place. Do away with their titles and and their um, entitlements to the product of the labor that they may or may not even contribute to and put everyone on an equal footing. So that, that's what he's talking about. At most 3,000 work days, probably much less. But let us examine his crops. Nearly 10 tons of carrots, nearly 10 tons of onions, radishes, and small vegetables, 6,000 heads of cabbage, 3,000 heads of cauliflower. And I'm <laughs> uh, just kind of a technical note. I, I noticed that as I just set my can down there, I'm, I'm trying to be as quiet as possible, but because of my new system, I've had to uh, rig up my microphone to the desk that, that I'm actually sitting at, and I'm noticing that it's, it's transferring sound. So I apologize to you if, you, if you're sensitive to those sorts of things and, you, and you're listening in, uh, but I'm going to try. I'll, f I'll figure out something else in the future so that we can take the, the microphone stand off of the, the the desk itself so you don't hear like every you know clack on the, the keyboard quite as much it's not reverberating through the arm so just a little side note for you in case that's bothering you five thousand baskets of tomatoes five thousand dozen of choice fruit one hundred and fifty four thousand salads in short a total of 123 tons of vegetables and fruit to 2.7 acres 120 yards long by 109 yards broad which makes more than 44 tons of vegetables to the acre but a man does not eat more than 660 pounds of vegetables and fruit a year, and two and one half acres of a market garden yield. And, that, and that's, you know, kind of cool that, that he took the time, or at least took the time to look up uh, these sorts of stats. Like, they're, they're really trying to be scientific about a needs-based economy. You know, just saying, well, how much food does a person need? Uh, a lot, you know, a ton you know, a couple tons a year, maybe, I don't know, like that. Once you multiply that sort of a calculation over the thousands and then millions, you know, or tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, uh, if you're off by a little bit, then your need could be far outweighed by, by what your calculation, what, what your calculated need could be. So he's really taking the time to, to say, no, per person, what's on, what's on average, the amount of food 
of, of vegetable, of meat, of cheese, of milk, you know, just go on, on and on down the line. How much food does a person need? And today we, we might do it more by calories and, and nutrient content and that sort of thing, more so than, than just, you know, eat, here are the food groups. Here's how we can say how much a person will, eat, will need to eat. Um, but, but he's really trying, but the, the point is he's really trying to be scientific about it so that we can really get a better conception of what sort of a society we still need to be maintaining and how much labor we need to be putting towards the effort of feeding people. So yeah, I, I think that's just really cool that, that he's taking the time to do that rather than just kind of pushing it off into the abstract or the, you know, fuzzy math sort of, of calculation enough vegetables and fruit to richly supply the table of 350 adults during the year. Thus, 24 persons employed a whole year in cultivating 2.7 acres of land, and only five working hours a day would produce sufficient vegetables and fruit for 350 adults, which is equivalent at least to 500 individuals. To put it another way... And, and just imagine, what would you do with your time if you had a five-hour workday? I literally work... A 10-hour work day. I, I do four 10-hour days a week um, doing this sort of labor. I do I do landscaping, and a good portion of what I do is, is pretty strenuous, out in the elements, manual labor. Like, we worked through a rainstorm the other day, uh, worked in the hot sun the day after, um, got another heat wave coming up, and I'll be out there working again, planting bushes and, and other sorts of, of perennial plants, uh, any of which could also be edible if they were planned out right. I mean, some of them are, people just don't realize it. I, I pointed out to my coworker the other day that, that any sort of day lily, you can just eat the petals from and it tastes like lettuce. It, I mean, it really tastes like lettuce. There's a very lettuce-y flavor to it. It's a similar texture and you can, uh, you can jazz up a, a salad, if you will. Uh, but yeah, I could be putting the, okay, I, I, I guess I've, I've lost the thread a little bit, but, but the point, I guess I'm trying to make is that I know what sort of labor he's talking about and I can appreciate doing half of that and, and still getting by and having the, 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 literally the second half of my day uh, free to do whatever I feel like. I, I know I would spend a lot more of it doing stuff like this, like streaming. Uh, and, and, and I consider this to be uh, very useful and productive work. I, I really have gotten a lot out of it for myself and I, and I hope that I'm, helping other people get um, fulfillment out of it as well. But I could be free to do any sorts of things. I could, I could, you know, if, if I worked for that company for five hours a day and I was an equal part uh, owner in that company, um, so I really had agency, I would also be feeling pretty good about the work that I was doing because I would more than likely be adequately compensated for it. Um, I would have... I would have health insurance through it, which has, has not yet been offered to me through this particular position. Uh, or, or, I mean, actually, ideally, there would be universal health care, but, but still, uh, I would have more of a cushion that, that comes with, with having a good job, basically, is what I'm trying to say. So not only would I be feeling good, I, I'd be mentally prepared, I'd also be, be physically prepared in, in term or material materially prepared in terms of having the money and and now the time if I wanted to start another pursuit if I wanted to to branch out into a, a type of agri of, of landscaping even that uh, my company you know my, my fellow worker owners didn't want to do uh, that might be something like container gardening this is this has been a, a dream of mine for a while to start a container gardening business where I, um, you know, I, I look around the city. Uh, I, I spend a lot of time in downtown Minneapolis and St. Paul for my work. Uh, and I notice that, that every new residential high rise that goes up, and there's been quite a few of them as of late, and, and even in the past five years, I, I'd say we've, uh, you know, it's gotta be at least a, a dozen or so very large buildings that have been added. But, but anyway, Every residential unit has a balcony on it, and that's another space that, that could be utilized for growing food. And when you get that far up, um, it's not, not really practical to have actual soil 
laid out across a sort of balcony that you could just plant directly into, you, you would need it would need to be reinforced way too much. But you can do container gardens, and you can have them uh, just overflowing with with produce and flowers and, and and all sorts of cool things that that would help really soften the area, and also give you something just a little bit in return in the form of food. Um, and in, in permaculture terms, that's, that's what's known as uh, stacking functions or, or also it's often termed um, using the edges and valuing the marginal. This is, this is marginal space. It's not really thought of too often as, as productive space for growing food for sure, but, but even for all that much flowers. But if you just turn things on their head a little bit and, and you, you employ some good design, you can really pack these, these balconies full of produce without endangering any sort of other aspect of them, without putting too much weight on them, without having people, you know, have to, you know, maneuver their body awkwardly to get around all their, their food and stuff. You can still get a lot of, of, of stuff out of it without taking up all that much extra space. Um, and so there's there's a marginal space that's that's not really being used or utilized at all, uh, and in terms of an ecosystem, it's it's virtually a desert. Uh, you're not going to see much wildlife except for maybe an occasional pigeon perches or, or or a bug flutters by, but but other than that, it's it's mostly a desert. But you could turn it into something more. So that's been that's been a a. a a dream of mine uh, for the past couple of years, and that's something that I might be able to pursue if I had more agency in my life. And having the sort of system that, that Kropotkin is talking about would definitely give me both that agency as, as well as that time uh, and, and that restfulness uh, that goes along with having that more time and, and not overexerting myself every day. It would give me the time to do this sort of a pursuit. And... But, it, I mean, it doesn't have to be that sort of a business. It could be anything. It could be anything you think of. Uh, any sort of big hobby that you would turn into a, a business. Or not even a business. You could just do devote more time to your hobby. How great would that be? Um, so, yeah, the, these, are the, these are the sorts of, of promises that are, are being made by uh, Kropotkin's sort of society. More good for more people, basically, when it, when it comes down to it more agency, more democracy, more, more ability to control your own destiny um, is, is what he's offering. And I'd say that's pretty tempting. That would be pretty tempting to the average person. And then if everyone you know gets the same thing, all, that, all these sorts of gains start multiplying on each other. And, and then you really start to see that it's not just... Uh, Oh, I'm sorry, I'm missing some comments here. Uh, so it's it's not just a, a pie-in-the-sky sort of idea. This is something that, that, that people really could be swayed by if given enough time and, and enough space to really consider it. And then if enough people were on board with it, 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 it becomes a lot more realistic-sounding, at least to me. Let's take some, uh, some questions here. Hello, Wizard's Bread Book. I, I uh, rem remember you from before. Cold Take. Uh, Berkman's ABCs of anarchism is better intro to anarchism than the conquest of bread. Uh, yeah, you know what? As I recall, it's not that long of a text either, is it? I think I, I think I have read it before, but if not, I'm going to look it up. So, so um, perhaps you missed earlier, but I do tend to alternate back and forth between anarchist and and communist thought. So, so the next one we're going to do is principles of communism after this book wraps up, which is going to be tonight, which I'm excited for. And, and then uh, Berkman's ABCs of, of Anarchism might be a good one to, to then rotate back to after we do Principles of Communism. So, so thank you very much for that suggestion. Um, so are you talking about edible scenery in urban spaces? Because that's heckin' rad. Yeah. <laughs> I like the way you put it. Uh, yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Um, on, on this channel, I try to fold in not only uh, leftist ideas, but I try to fold in some more ideas of, of permaculture which is creating more resilient systems, um, kind of man being a, a, a participant in the ecosystem, a, a co-creator with uh, his fellow organisms. Um, 
and, and creating resilient systems that, that can stand up to future shocks so say, climate change or that sort of thing. And then I also try to uh, fold in ideas of new urbanism and density can be a part of new urbanism. It doesn't have to be, and if it's done wrong, it goes against what I would consider new urbanist pr principles of building community and bringing people together in, and creating the most vibrant sort of a city that you possibly can. Uh, but, but definitely when you add in ideas of growing food and, and sharing it with your local community and bringing in these leftist ideas of mutual aid and stuff like that, well, new urbanism can really benefit from those concepts and, and be strengthened by it. And I think all these three concepts can all strengthen each other. Uh, that being, we'll just call it leftism. Uh, in, in my case, uh, anarchism is, is what I tend to defer to. Uh, new urbanism and then permaculture. I think these three have some really good synergy synergies um, at the core of them. And so I try to fold those ideas in as well. Uh, so you also say guerrilla gardening with seed bombs. I've, I've made seed, uh, plenty of seed bombs in my day. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, I'm going to bring it up in, in a future stream, possibly even this Sunday, where we'll talk about seed bombs themselves. It's a really cool way of, of distributing a lot of, of, uh, plant, you know, I guess you could even call it potential plants, uh, very quickly over a large area with, with no machinery required, um, and then guarding it against predation before it's ready to be, uh, re before it's ready to germinate and, and kind of, you know, try its luck out in, in the world, in the ecosystem. Uh, so, see, so guerrilla gardening with seed bombs is an option. Propaganda of the deed doesn't have to be acts of force. I agree as well. So, uh, though though Kropotkin himself is, I think, pretty literally talking about a revolution, I personally don't think it has to be some sort of overthrow of, of the current power structure in a, in a violent and forceful way. I, I would tend to agree with that. Also because it would be a very difficult thing in this day and age to do because the current power structure has just so much force at its disposal. I mean, see how they react to something as, as simple as as black people saying that their lives matter and that they shouldn't be murdered by police in the streets. Just for them even stating that, they get violent pushback from the state. Um, so imagine if you were actually trying to, to perform any sort of actual coup. Uh, not to say that that would never be uh, possible. It's, it's not as though um, any force is invincible. Um, as, as America found out with um, uh, the Vietnam War, uh, the Korean War, um, mm -hmm. the, the occupation of Afghanistan, the occupation of Iraq. Like, uh, even though we, we have so much more military might, there's, there's been these forces that have time and time again been able to resist complete control of the U.S. state as, as they invade. So it's not an impossibility it's a route I'd rather personally not go down, though, um, just because of how much innocent blood would be spilled. And I and I think we can, if we just do it right, and and we we uh, look at the power of community building, um, that we can perhaps uh, work together to to create new networks that then don't require the the um, inputs from the owner class of, of people. I don't know if I'm, I'm phrasing that in a way that, that, that makes sense, but, but basically creating parallel, uh, I guess one way of putting it is, is, is parallel government structures. So providing food, which permaculture really factors heavily in with that, housing, new urbanism and permaculture really factor heavy in with that. Uh, I can really enhance those ideas. Um, clothing, you know, education, which, hey, we're doing that for, for free, basically, right now. Um, communication, so on and so forth. The, the basics of life, if we set up parallel structures just within our own communities and we have enough people moving in the same direction, perhaps we can get to the point where we're not, you know, at the mercy of these larger corporate entities. That, that would be my preferred uh, strategy if we're actually going to enact any of these sorts of ideas at all. But I think the ideas of, of post-revolution would still apply, that we, have, we, we can't just be focused on 
building these 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 uh, bureaucratic structures and, and figuring out who gets what and um, in terms of, of power, but instead invest these ideas into the people that are enacting them. You know, um, so I think it, I think his ideas still apply even if you're not doing a physical revolution. Um, uh, yeah. So okay. Do do do. I'm not super big into the divide. Oh, this is also a wizard bread, wizard's bread book. You got quite a few questions, which I very much appreciate. Um, and, and statements as well. I'm not super in, big into the divide between Marxists and anarchists. As long as we can, uh, we are working for the, the freedom of oppressed people. Can't agree with that more. Uh, I'm super down. Mass line is the best line. I agree. You know, keep, and, and, and I think, Kropotkin is, is really good at laying that out. We got to keep our eyes on the prize, and 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 that is creating a democratic, egalitarian, um, liberating society where people have their basic needs met, and uh, agency and democracy in their workplace, whatever that may be, and 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 by whatever means you you procure it. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Wizard's Bread Book also says, I also have some quick questions, if you don't mind. Don't mind at all. Uh, if you want to stay on topic, no worries, though. Uh, they are all kind, uh, they are kind of all over the place. Uh, but I, ha I like to have a good idea of who a person is before I follow and host. Uh, so, you're saying my, <laughs> my statements are a bit all over the place? Yeah, you know, I, I'm kind of organized. Okay, uh, we are back on. Uh, sorry about that interruption there. The the power suddenly just cut out to the whole neighborhood. Um, I was I was checking the the notification from Excel, which is our our power provider, and they said that it was out to about twenty one hundred people. So must have been some sort of transformer blue or or some huge uh, part of the grid just went down for some reason. Let's continue on with the Conquest of Bread, just to get everyone back on the same page. Uh, we were talking about permaculture. We are talking about how, uh, through use of those techniques, we, we can fulfill some of these promises that, that Kropotkin is talking about of, of a lower number of work hours per day while still producing enough food for everybody. Uh, and at the same time, with, with good design techniques and appropriate technology, I think we can do even better. Oh, and that's, that's right. That's, that's where we had just left off. So we were looking at growing power as an example of one of the most productive forms of, of modern urban agriculture that is out right now. I'm, I'm seeing a bunch of links here that say the things like the rise and fall of growing power, what happened to growing power. So I wonder if it's actually come into some trouble. I mean, uh, Milwaukee Greenhouse remains full of life after Growing Power disbands. Oh, that's sad to see that the organization of Growing Power had disbanded. So it, uh, it was for 25 years. Urban farming nonprofit Growing Power taught kids and adults in Milwaukee's northwest side to grow and consume local food. I hope it's still some sort of an urban farm. But even if it's not, we can we can still look at it as a, at it as an example of producing a whole lot of food with very little machinery. Uh, basically, the only pieces of machinery that the greenhouse uh, greenhouses it's it's so so. Let me back up one second and set the stage a little bit more. So, growing power was an urban farm uh, complex of greenhouses, and there was also some some. There was a more outdoor space for, uh, there was a goat pen, there was some, some chicken pen areas and stuff like that as well. But primarily it was, it was greenhouses where they had aquaponics setups inside. Um, and so aquaponics, again, is the, the merger of aquaculture, which is growing uh, uh, food in an, uh, uh, some sort of aquatic solution. Um, and then... Uh, aquaculture, which is the raising of, of fish. It's, it's the farming of fish, uh, generally. And so they put those two systems together, and in, in 
uh, true permaculture fashion, even though they, they never were deemed a, a fully permaculture sort of operation, they, they still were following the principle of producing no waste, uh, which is a very important principle uh, from David Holmgren. The, uh, the idea with, with merging these two systems of aquaculture and, and hydroponics, uh, I, think it, I think it said hydroponics was the growing in an aqueous solution. Um, anyway, if you put those two systems together, then you have what was a pollution problem in, in the case of raising fish, which is they produce waste, they're living animals, they produce waste, uh, and you take that waste and turn it into a, a product, a nutrient for the plants. So you pump that, that dirty fish water through just the root beds of the plants, so there's very little chance of contamination, um, just if, if, that, if that's making you feel uncomfortable about uh, eating this sort of, of food, fear not. Most contaminations of, say, like leafy vegetables or that sort of thing come when you have uh, fertilizer spread on a field and then you get a rain soon after that splashes that fertilizer onto the leaves, which then contaminates it with, you know, Legionnaire's disease, whatever, whatever the disease may be in, in, the, in the manure. Uh, and then that is harvested soon after, um, and and that's how these 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 food poisoning incidents tend to occur. But with uh, aquaponics, you are there's there's no contact between the water and the the leaves or the leaves or the 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 edible part of the plant ever. It's just going through their their root um, systems. You know, you you put them in a Oftentimes you'll use expanded clay pellets, which are just these, as, as it says, it's just pellets of clay, and that acts as their growth medium. They send the roots down into there, and that way the water can get through, um, and the roots have access to all the nutrients that are coming through this, this dirty, quote-unquote, fish water, uh, and they're just taking up those nutrients. And so they're cleaning the water for the fish at the same time. You, you take one of the problems with... with um, hydroponics and that's getting nutrients oftentimes hydroponic solutions are, are um, an artificial soup basically of, of uh, uh, different um, elements that plants need you know your nitrogen your phosphorus uh, your potassium stuff like that all the stuff that the plant needs and it's artificially produced it's mined oftentimes uh, especially in the case of phosphorus um, and with the case of, of uh, nitrogen products, I believe it's often uh, coming from petroleum products. But instead of doing that in an aquaponic system, all the fertilizer is coming directly from the fish waste. So you solve the problem of having to create a bunch of fertilizer for your plants. So these two systems working in tandem together, hydroponics and aquaculture, makes aquaponics where you have a, a, a closer facsimile to an actual ecosystem and that that's exactly what permaculture is striving for now in addition to all those gains you have further gain as, as i had previously mentioned you have the gain from um, just being in a greenhouse so you have the passive solar gain so the it's literally the greenhouse effect where the greenhouse effect got its name from light shines in through the windows it it interacts with physical matter um, uh, it gets re that energy, then a portion of it gets re radiated as heat, which is then trapped by the glass. So you keep that heat gain in the system, less heating needed for the greenhouse. If you add on top of that, what growing power did a lot was they would do composting in a way, uh, known as hot composting, where you get the balance of nutrients, right. And, and the bacteria are they're they're digestive system gets it's so you know turbocharged i guess is a good way of putting it uh that they're they're, they're throwing off tons of heat so that's that's more heat that you're putting out into the building less heat that you need to supply through electricity although they also had solar panels as well so they could do that in a, in a renewable way they are valuing those renewable resources which is another permaculture principle and at the same time uh they would be um, producing more fertilizer for the plants. 
So, so at the end of the, the, the compost being broken down, this hot compost, you have finished compost, which you can then plug back into your system. And so on, on just three acres, they would produce more than a million pounds of food every year through their various systems. Um, they were also very big on, on worm farming as well. That's, that's another way that they helped cycle those nutrients again and again. Um, but, but yeah, they, they, they would uh, produce over a million pounds of food a year um, in, in fish, in vegetables, and, and in the other various animals and their products that they had on site. They had bees on site. Uh, they had, um, as, I, as I mentioned, goats and chickens as well. Um, so on just three acres, over a million pounds of food, and, that, and that's pretty remarkable. Uh, and, and basically, the only inputs they would have is food waste, uh, which they would then feed to their worms, uh, which in turn, some of the worms would get fed to the, the fish, but also they would collect their what's known as worm castings, which is just the, the worm excrement, uh, which is super powerful as or it's not super powerful, but it's a very good fertilizer. Um, and, and one of the main benefits of, of worm castings is the micro, uh, uh, microbial community um, that exists within them that, that helps build healthy soil webs. So, so they have very little actual input beyond um, you know, uh, uh, food waste coming in from various restaurants and, and stuff like that. Um, and then their output was a million pounds of food a year with, with very little need for heating, very little need for, um, I mean, I mean, they got to extend the, the season. They could go year round. So, uh, instead of a, what would, would normally be a very short growing season in, in Milwaukee's climate, they extended it to, to year round production. And, um, then with the solar panels, the, the other main uh, power needs that they had besides heating the spaces was for pumping the water through the various aquaponic systems. Um, but if you supply that with solar panels, well, then, you know, you're not contributing nearly as much to um, environmental destruction as you would if you were, say, just running a tractor on a, on a field. On a field. And all of these products were, were hand cultivated from from seed to to weeding and tending to the the various plant beds to harvest all just done by hand so so you cut out the need for heavy machinery uh, as i said the only machinery was basically to heat the, the spaces a little bit they probably had to have a little supplemental heat i don't think it all was provided by the compost and and the solar gain but but regardless a lot less heat or a lot less um uh, heat generated from electricity or, or other sources, um, and then to, to pump the water. So, yeah, if, if, we, if we mimic those sorts of systems going forward, then, then I think, yeah, um, urban farms can contribute quite a lot with a lot less work as well, just, just as Kropotkin has been saying in this chapter. We are doing the conquest of bread, just to, to remind you. Uh, final chapter, 17 on agriculture. Um, so we can do it with a lot less labor as well. And then if, if you add on top of that the, the worker-owner uh, combination system that, that Kripakin is talking about, we, we do away with workers and owners being separate, but the workers themselves directly owning the means of production, uh, as, as I have been saying, you cut out that need to, to give uh, a cut of your products of your labor to your landlord, to your, your owner of your business, because you are the owner and of, of both the business and of the land itself. So do away with rent seeking, do away with, with people that make money just by having money. Um, so yeah, I, th I think we can contribute considerably in, in relatively small spaces, uh, just shoehorned wherever they can be into the urban fabric. And permaculture can guide us a lot because with permaculture systems, if they were to really embrace permaculture in, in growing power, uh, 
they could do even more. Uh, they could, uh, no, those aren't great pictures of it. Let's find some more pictures of it. When I, when I talk about, um, aquaponic systems and stuff and be good to actually see that. So, okay. So here, here we have one of the, um, not giving me a good size picture. So basically this is one of the, the spaces where the, the fish were growing. Okay. There's a, a fish tank. And they take the water that's that's from this fish tank and they put it up into these multi-layered grow beds. So they had, I think they had two stacks in this particular configuration, but there's no reason you couldn't have even more stacked on top of each other as long as everything gets enough light. And just look at the abundance that's coming from it, all from that waste. But we can do even better if we, if we really apply permaculture principles of, of producing no waste and uh, using small and slow solutions um, these sorts of things I think can, can help this system be even better because one of the, the, one of the potential damages of the system is that it's heavy reliance on plastic. Uh, all these, these tanks were lined with plastic. The grow beds were lined with plastic. That's how they, they made things watertight and it doesn't have to be that way. We can use other appropriate technologies, uh, that are, that are more valuing renewable resources because plastic is not a renewable resource. Um, we can make things out of wood and through carefully constructing it, uh, put it together in a way where either there, there is no need for a sealant, as in the case of wine barrels. You may not be aware, but, but wine and whiskey and other, and other um, spirits uh, are made in barrels that they don't have any sort of a liner. They, it's it's bare wood, and just because of the way it's it's put together, and um, and uh, a set together piece by piece, some of the liquid is absorbed into the wood, which makes it swell shut. So it's being kept together just by uh, water pressure and then a metal band on the outside. But that that doesn't actually do anything to seal it. That just keeps everything in place. But we can, we can apply these sorts of techniques to um, aquaponics, and we can have fish raised in, in same sort of containers just without the plastic lining. So we can, take, we can take our dependence on petroleum products out just a little bit more. We can do the same thing with all the piping. Instead of using PVC piping, which for, is, is another non-renewable resource that also breaks down over time, we could even just change it to stainless steel, use stainless steel piping, which is going to last a lot longer. Um, also not exactly a renewable resource, but is recyclable at least. And if, if, um, if you're maintaining it well, it is going to last uh, a whole lot longer and, and not leach any sort of chemical into the water, which is another problem with the plastic is those plastics, through the, any, any plastic you have, even food grade plastic over the course of its lifetime is going to leach a certain amount of itself, uh, the chemicals that, that compose it into whatever water it comes in contact with. And that will make its way into the food. And that, and, and that's part of what contributes to how they say that, that the average American consumes about a credit card worth of plastic every week. Part of it's coming just from leaching from water, um, into, into our, our water systems, um, but also uh, in the case of a place like this, like uh, I, I'm sure that commercial aquaculture the, on the large scale is, is going to be using plastic as well. So there's probably a lot of it that comes from that as well. But we can do, like I say, with, with permaculture principles, we can do without it. We can design things in a, in a better way. We can get rid of all these plastic pots Switch them out for terracotta, which is, is not going to contribute to any sort of leaching of chemicals and is not going to make us dependent on petroleum products. Um, it literally is the earth, you know, uh, unglazed clay pots or terracotta or what have you. Um, and then also, in, instead of reliance on the machinery of water pumps, if we were to just design things to work with nature a little bit better, 
we could be doing things like directly pumping the water through uh, windmills, essentially. Uh, they'd be, they'd be uh, they could be like uh, one of those vertical axis wind turbines. You know what I'm talking about? That, that um, let me just bring up a picture. So you got it in your mind. So you could take something like this. Uh, let's look at some images here. And that's a really pretty one. Uh, but yeah, just something like this that you may have seen, like the, the, the double helix style vertical axis wind turbine. So, so the axis of it is, is vertical and it just spins. Oh boy, it's zooming in. <laughs> uh, so it just, it just spins around that one point. Um, so no matter which way the wind is blowing, doesn't have to doesn't have it, it turns but it doesn't have to face towards the wind it will catch the wind as long as it's going straight across um, the turbine but instead of using that to generate electricity which we would then use to run the pumps we could instead take that power more directly uh, to pump the water up just you know 10 15 feet um, there's a long history of farmers using this sort of thing to provide uh, water to their 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 farms. You know, just as as the wind blows, it, it it pumps water up. There's it's it's pretty simple technology that does it. Just takes a few gears and some you know chains um, to run the pump, and then uh, we can run the system without those pumps at all. So we're even less dependent on, on fossil fuels or any sort of electricity source by doing stuff like that. So then these, these ideas that Kropotkin has of providing tons of food for people, like literally tons of food for people, uh, again, that doesn't seem so far-fetched. And it doesn't also seem far-fetched to do it without such reliance on heavy machinery. Of course, you'll need some machinery to build the buildings initially, um, and you may need machinery for things like heaters, uh, just for, for those rare times when your other systems of heat generation aren't quite enough. Um, but we can, we can do with a lot less if we just design things well, and we can do things for a lot less labor if we just design things well to, to work with each other, to, to integrate rather than segregate these systems so that they, they more, more or less synergize with one another, uh, build upon one another, and, and complement and support one another. Um, so yeah, I think with that, we can really come a whole lot closer to Kropotkin's dream of, of people being basically locally self-reliant, not, not self-sufficient. You know, self-sufficiency implies more uh, uh, a drawing away from and an isolation from the rest of the wider world. We don't have to, we don't have to go that far. Uh, that's probably not a good idea to go that far. There's always going to be some things that you can't produce locally. It may just be something as simple as salt, you know? Um, it could be something as, as complex as, as components needed for computers, you know, but you're not gonna be able to do absolutely everything locally. And it's, it's not necessarily, uh, a good or a wise idea to do so. But we can do a lot more locally. Uh, and by doing so, we take away a lot of the power from large actors uh, that could try and exert force on us, on our lives. All right. Let's move on in the chapter. Hear a little bit more about what he has to say. For Acre. But do not these facts, which could be verified by every one, prove that 17,300 acres of the 519,000 remaining to us would suffice to give all necessary vegetables as well as a liberal amount of fruit to the three and one half million inhabitants of our two departments? As to the quantity of work necessary to produce these fruits and vegetables, it would amount to 50 million workdays of five hours, 50 days per adult male, if we measure by the market gardener's standard of work. But we could reduce this quantity if we had recourse to the process in vogue in Jersey and Guernsey. We must also remember that the Paris market gardener is forced to work so hard because he mostly produces early season fruits, the high prices of which have to pay for fabulous rents, 
and that the system of culture entails more work than is necessary for growing the ordinary. So again, we're, we're cutting out the need for rent seekers. We're cutting out the need for owners. And by all of that, all of those extra burdens on, on the system of production being removed, we end up with, with a lot, with, with a surplus of not only materials, but time and effort because it's not all being skimmed off by people that, that are, are taking it just because of some arbitrary position that they occupy in society. Um, so yeah, let's continue. ...staple food, vegetables, and fruit. Besides, the market gardeners of Paris, not having the means to make a great outlay on their gardens and being obliged to pay heavily for glass, wood, iron, and coal, obtain their artificial heat out of manure, while it can be had at much less cost in hothouses. Part four. So even Grabakin's talking about using hot houses, which I, I assume is just an, another word for um, greenhouses. He's talking about just, you know, use the, the, the natural world and, and the gains that you can get through good design. Here's another component where, or here's another part where uh, new urbanism can, can lend a hand to good design because... Um, uh, when you when you get into two things like architecture, you can get into things like passive solar, which which as we were just talking about, can uh, drastically lessen the need for heating even in cold climates. Um, so not not just food production places, but housing. And what and what if we combine those two ideas together? What if we took a portion of our food production and put it right up against housing? Uh, say, you know, just for simplicity's sake, you imagine a, a five-story apartment complex. Um, and each of those has a balcony. And then uh, let, let's say it's, it's arranged in, in a U shape. Um, and the, the, the middle part of the U, which I guess if you're looking at it uh, head-on would be more of an N shaped, I suppose, but doesn't matter. A a a uh, horseshoe shape. We'll we'll call it a horseshoe shape. So the middle of the that horseshoe was facing south. So if you were to be standing in the middle of that courtyard, you'd be facing south. Now, what if we imagined that instead of that courtyard being the outdoors, we just took panes of glass and glassed it in okay so you have a, a glass we'll just we'll just say it we'll have a glass roof over that that middle part of the horseshoe and we'll have a glass facade so we're only doing two parts of it the the other uh three walls and the floor are are, are as they normally would be they're, they're the, the the facade of the building and and the literal the, the, the ground the outdoor ground but now we're, we're, we're enclosing it. And what if we did some food production in that space? Um, even if it's nothing big or major, it would add something. And at the same time, that, that passive solar gain would help people heat their houses. Um, so again, we're, we're, we're putting two ideas together, building things in a certain way to begin with, that, that can that can promote community. You could have a community garden right there in that that courtyard, um, which which works well for new urbanism. Uh, and you're also providing lower cost housing, which also is a component of of good community design, because you're reducing the need for heating. Even if people still have to heat their house, some uh, it's going to be less because they have that one wall that 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 looks out into a greenhouse. And at the same time, you're producing food together at the same time. So, so these, these, these components of these, what, what could be far flung and disparate components of life where you get your, your, you know, all hundred percent of your food from the four corners of the earth. And your housing is completely separate from that entire operation by putting them together, by integrating rather than segregating, we get synergies between the two, right? 
So we, we produce heat not only for food production, but for housing. And we produce housing that's oriented around food production. You see how these ideas can, can merge together? All right. Pressing on. So, as we were discussing, uh, what Kropotkin is talking about is producing more food uh, on very little space because we're taking out uh, the, the needs of the rent seekers, the, the owners of the business, and the, the literal landlords. And, and all of that producing um, adequate amount of food for people, at, at the same time leaving them with more leisure time because it requires less work because you're not working those few hours a day uh, just for the profit of somebody else. You're just, you're just working for yourselves and your own venture with your fellow uh, co-op owners and workers, or worker owners, I should say. So we were talking about how we can uh, enhance those ideas even more by folding in ideas of permaculture um, and, and new urbanism as well and, and having good design uh, we, we had just been talking about uh, having a horseshoe-shaped uh, apartment complex, about you know, say five stories tall. That, that's that's tall enough that if you glass in the the roof of that courtyard as well as the the exposed front, and and you make a, a contained space, that you can have things like trees. Uh, you're not going to have trees that that get much taller than. Uh, five stories, uh, and, and I mean, you can, you can plan it so that you don't. You can select species that are, are shorter, uh, so that you never have to worry about, uh, you know, them popping the glass off at the top. At the same time, you're, you're providing uh, different climates than, than perhaps you are living in right now if you're in, a, in more of a temperate climate with, with cold winters and, and that sort of thing, which is where you would need a greenhouse most of all. Um, you can be growing more tropical stuff, stuff that, that maybe has to come from thousands of miles away for you to have any access to it. Well, now, now we're creating an entirely new market locally of mangoes or passion fruit or, um, let's see, any, any number of, of, of fruits and vegetables and nuts that, that are just not possible to be locally available in a colder climate. How about that too? Um, so yeah, so, so I think what Kropotkin is talking about is, is not only entirely possible, but uh, can be made even better by folding in these, these permaculture ideas and, and applying them to the sorts of, of uh, structures that he is talking about. All right, let's get back to the chapter. Uh, we, we are just going to persevere no matter what, and, and we're going to finish this up tonight. The market gardeners, we say, are forced to become machines and to renounce all joys of life in order to obtain their marvelous crops. But these hard grinders have rendered a great service to humanity in teaching us that the soil can be made. They make it with old hot beds of manure, which have... Ah, it, it sounds like a form of hot composting, in fact. We can make the, the soil today with even more methods. Um, he's just talking about using animal manure and, and likely combining it with the, the right amount of uh, straw or leaves or other dried woody material to create a hot compost that, that breaks down very quickly. Also, if you're doing it in a greenhouse, as, as we've been talking about, generates a bit of heat for you in the winter time and leaves you with very rich, nutritious, soil additive that can go back into your system but we can do it with other things like like we can do what's known as vermicomposting so we take things like worms like like uh, red wigglers is the most common one that, that have high metabolisms that reproduce quickly and they can eat down a large portion of, of, of fruits and vegetables because uh, the, there's always going to be some waste you know if you if you grow a banana tree you're not likely to eat the banana peels. They got to they gotta go somewhere. Uh, and there'll be plants that die and, and need to be, you know, recycled back into the system. Um, so you're going to have, you're going to have waste no matter what. Why don't we put that waste back into the system as efficiently as possible? So you can use worms for that. 
There's also uh, a species of fly called black soldier fly. Now this has has potentially multiple benefits to it. Um, let's let's pull that up as well. Just so we have a little bit of an idea of what we're we're talking about. We don't need to have this vault back up. So the black soldier fly, uh, endemic to to places like North America, I think it. There might be other species in other countries, but I, I'm just aware that it's um, uh, so black soldier fly. Its entire adult life, at the time that it spends as a fly, uh, all it does is drink some water to keep itself going for a few days while it searches for a mate. And then the, the male and female f meet up um, the males mate and then die. That, that, that's, that's the end of their life cycle. And the females find a good place to, to lay their eggs and then they die. That's, that's their entire adult life cycle. It's very brief. They spend most of their life as larvae. So after they, they hatch from their eggs, they start eating and they are voracious eaters. They can go through bone, um, they can go through meat. They can even go through things like uh, human waste or animal waste. Um, they will eat whatever's in front of them, basically. And the thing about it is, is um, their their larvae are virtually immune to passing along diseases such as E. coli. They, they crush it right in their gut. Uh, it does not survive. But the, the, the cool thing is, 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 is they have such high metabolisms that they, you have to ventilate these, these composters that you make for them. The, the standard structure is like a, a five-gallon bucket, like, like you might see a plastic bucket at Home Depot or whatever. And you have them inside this bucket with whatever food, you, you want to, whatever food waste you want to give to them. And they just eat and eat, and, and they're digesting and growing so fast that they're throwing off enough heat that you need to ventilate it. Otherwise, you can get too much uh, buildup in there, and, and, and they may, I guess they may end up killing themselves. It gets so hot. So there's a potential for generating a little bit more heat to your system. Beyond that, once they've gorged themselves for long enough, what they do next is they search for a place to uh, to enter their next stage of metamorphosis to to I, I don't know if they go into a cocoon what 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 that that stage actually looks like but they look for a place to bury themselves well they metamorphize into their adult winged version okay so they'll they'll just start walking basically and if you do it right like 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 in the case of the bucket if you have a little ramp that curls all the way around the inside of the bucket, they will walk. They'll find that ramp and they'll walk all the way up on their own. And then you can lead them down a tube uh, where you can collect them and, and decide whether or not you want to let some of them go, you know, start the cycle over and, and become adults and, and keep the system going. And then some of them you can take as, well, you know what they make good food for? It happens to be fish. Uh, you can feed them right to fish, and they're a very high source of, of protein and fat, and they will help those fish grow. So you've taken a, a food waste product, and through no artificial means, you've sped up its, its processing from food waste into food product that you can then feed back into your system. And as I said, the adults, they don't, they don't bite, they don't carry disease, they're, they... Their mouth parts are only good for drinking water, basically. They don't, they don't consume food as adults, so there's no chance of them spreading disease. Their larvae also don't spread disease. And then you're also processing it through, then, the body of a fish to make more food for, then, potentially humans, right? So it's a very safe and, and self-regenerating system that you can supercharge your composting system. Um, so 
so yeah, so that that just that's what I I thought of when he uh, mentioned, um, when he mentioned doing a hot compost. You know, that, that that's that's immediately where I went to. Like we we've studied these things now, and we've come up with even better systems that can really help move these these food production, urban food production systems along. Another cool thing about those those black soldier flies is their larvae emit a, a pheromone that will scare away your common house fly. You know, all the all the flies that you would worry about as disease carriers will stay away from these larvae because they know that if they lay their eggs there in 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 whatever food waste it is, that they will be completely out their 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 larvae will be completely outcompeted by these black soldier fly larvae. So they just stay away. So that's even another added bonus to using them in the system. And it's just it's just a really cool way of integrating another species into our system so that we're working together. It's a it's a kind of symbiosis really. They get access to great quality food for for their young. They continue on their life cycle again and again and we get a really good food source for our food systems and a really great way to break down what otherwise would take a long time to be processed as as food waste so i, I just think i think that could be a really great addition to the things that kropotkin is talking about in in designing his food system have already served to give us the necessary warmth to young plants and to early fruit and they make it in such great quantity that they are compelled to sell it in part Otherwise, it would raise the level of their gardens by one inch every year. They do it so well, so Baral teaches us in his Dictionary of Agriculture, in an article on market gardeners, that in recent contracts, the market gardener stipulates that he will carry away his soil with him when he leaves the bit of ground he is cultivating. All right, and we, we can continue with this sort of thing. He's talking about regenerating soil so quickly that you have to have a contract with the person to, to cart it away once it's done. Right? Uh, I mean, talk about generating abundance. Talk about uh, a regenerative sort of system. We can do this too. And we can do it even better than in Kropotkin's time. Because these, these theories, such as permaculture, have been developed uh, since, you know, long since his, his passing. Um, so, so these things he's talking about, they're, they're not... Again, they're not some pie-in-the-sky idea. They can happen. We can do this together. But we have to choose to. And we have to choose to organize and create uh, these sorts of parallel systems that, that can produce the sort of abundance that we need to support each other and reduce our dependence and our, our um, ability or, or our um, other forces ability to to influence us reduce the re reduce their ability to to influence us um yeah let's continue. loam carried away on carts with furniture and glass frames that is the answer of practical cultivators to the learned treaties of ricardo who represented rent as a means of equalizing the natural advantages of the soil quote the soil is worth what the man is worth that is the gardener's motto and yet the market gardeners of Paris and Rouen labor three times as hard to obtain the same results as their fellow workers in Guernsey or in England. Applying industry to agriculture, these last make their climate in addition to their soil by means of the greenhouse. Fifty years ago, the greenhouse was the luxury of the rich. It was kept to grow exotic plants for pleasure. But nowadays, its use begins to be generalized. A tremendous industry has grown up lately in Guernsey and Jersey, where hundreds of acres are already covered with glass to say nothing of the countless small greenhouses kept in every little farm garden. Acres and acres of greenhouses. And we can do this again. And and, and, and as we talk and as we were discussing with, with my idea of uh, a horseshoe shaped apartment complex, we can integrate this with our with our housing policy as well. All these systems can can conspire or, or be made to conspire to uplift people. Uh, to to set them on a platform where they can uh, actually make decisions for themselves and about what they want with their life, with with their work, um, with the things they want to pursue, uh, with with whatever it is they feel 
helps them reach their highest potential. Um, these are things that are within our reach. It takes more than anything, just organizing. Organizing for that sort of thing. So yeah, let, let's, uh, let's continue on even a little bit more. So I've lately been built also at Worthing, 103 acres in 1912, in the suburbs of London, and in several other parts of England and Scotland. They are built of all qualities, beginning with those which have granite walls down to those which represent mere shelters made in planks and glass frames, which cost, even now with all the tribute paid to capitalists and middlemen, less than three shillings, six pennies per square yard under glass. Most of them are heated for at least three of four months every year, but even the cool greenhouses, which are not heated at all, give excellent results. Of course, not for growing grapes and tropical plants, but for potatoes, carrots, peas, tomatoes, and so on. In this way, man and man... Ah, and, and there's a popular uh, technique that's used to, to extend seasons uh, that's known as, as cold framing, where you build a frame around a raised bed, and then you have, um, you know, <laughs> basically a mini greenhouse on top of it. You put, you know, glass, usually a, a pitched roof, you can then swing open one side or the other. Um, and, and just that little bit of passive solar will extend the season. So we, we can do these things. These are, these are definitely techniques we can employ. He emancipates himself from climate. And at the same time, he avoids also the heavy work with the hotbeds. And he saves both in buying much less manure and in work. Three men to the acre, each of them working less than 60 hours a week, produce on very small spaces what formerly requires acres and acres of land. The result of all of these recent conquests of culture is that if one half only of the adults of a city gave each about 50 half days for the culture of the finest fruit and vegetables out of season, they would have all the year round an unlimited supply of that sort of fruit and vegetables for the whole population. But there is a still more important fact to notice. The greenhouse has nowadays a tendency to become a mere kitchen garden under glass. And when it is used to such a purpose, the simplest plank and glass unheated shelters already give fabulous crops, such as, for instance, 500 bushels of potatoes per acre as a first crop, ready by the end of April. After which, a second and third crop are obtained in the extremely high temperatures, which prevail in the summer under glass. I gave in my fields, factories, and workshops most striking facts in this direction. Sufficient to say here that, at Jersey, 34 men with one trained gardener only cultivate 13 acres under glass, from which they obtain 143 tons of fruit and early vegetables, using for this extraordinary culture less than 1,000 tons of coal. And this is done now in Guernsey and Jersey on a very large scale, quite a number of steamers. And again, today we can even improve on that technology. Instead of having to have coal-powered greenhouses, for as much electricity as we may still need, uh, we can um, we can instead be doing these things. Oh, hello, Ali Osher. Good, good to see you. Good to see you over at uh, uh, Feminist Critiques chat as well. That was a lot of fun. What what they were doing. Um, anyway, we we can we can move beyond these these fossil fuels that he's talking about using in order to to achieve. Uh, results with all these greenhouses we can we can do solar panels we can do passive solar we can do passive solar water heating especially if we're doing something like aquaponics that could feed right into that uh, so we could be heating the greenhouse indirect uh, i mean you know not just heating the air but heating the water and you know what water is a much better heat sink um, a, mu a much more uh a much more um, efficient way of, of leveling out temperatures than than air is you know air i mean literally think about it you you open your refrigerator door the air rushes out first the the the, the first thing to, to to rise in in temperature is the air but you still can can grab like a, you know a container of milk or something like that and it's still cold in your refrigerator why is that it's because the the liquid retains its temperature for a lot longer than the air does. So if we're heating the water in our aquaponics system, it's going to heat that greenhouse that we're doing it in, assuming we're doing it in a greenhouse, even longer than if we just used it to heat the air. So so we can we can do these things uh, even better than, than Kropotkin could have imagined at his time, because he was talking about using coal. We can do it better. 
Ah, so Alyosha says, society is supposed to evolve. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, oh, you're streaming right now, and uh, thanks for your support. Oh, great. You know, I, I hope your stream is going really well. I saw earlier that you were uh, looking at some, some political stuff again, so I hope you're, you're uh, having a good time doing that. And, uh, you know, it depends on what time I, I end this, but um, perhaps I'll, I will uh, raid into you later on. But, but yeah, awesome. Good to see you. Uh, everyone, everyone, please follow Ali Osher, really great leftist political streamer. Um, very, very smart and uh, has, has great takes on, on modern day politics. So I very much encourage you to, to go follow uh, their channel. Anyway, so as I was saying, yeah, we, we can do things even better than he could have ever imagined. Uh, 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 okay, so solar energy isn't a one-step fix. Well, well, I mean, nothing I'm talking about, I'm saying, is, is it's going to, you know, snap your fingers and, and all of a sudden everything falls into place. No, no, no. Uh, these all take a lot of effort and, and well, you know, money as well to, to accomplish at this, at this point in the game. Uh, you have to change the whole grid and infrastructure. Not necessarily. Um, especially if we're talking about passive solar, which doesn't require any sort of solar panels or anything like that. All it takes is perhaps glass. So you have a way for the, the light to get in that also then traps the heat from getting out. And then also a, a heat sink, um, which could be just a, a large pond. That, that's a really great heat sink. And if we're growing some food in that pond, it's, it's serving double duty. We can, we can get even more back from it. Um, so we need to have a way that, that during the day, the sun can heat something, uh, it's, it's usually called a thermal mass, uh, and then slowly over time, when the sun is down, re-radiates back out, and then we're taking care of at least the, the heating problem in, in colder climates. In terms of electricity, yeah, probably, probably going to need some electricity source there. Uh, but with solar panels, um, or wind uh, turbines, we can create energy from renewable sources that we can then store in batteries on site and, and then use, you know, as, as needed. So we, we can, we can even out those, those peaks and valleys of, of energy needs and energy production. So we can do these things that, that Kropotkin is talking about. We can, we can produce a lot of food within cities. And uh, we can spend a lot of less time and effort doing it if we move to a system like the one he's talking about, where we're, we're again, I'm, I'm going to keep repeating myself, but where we're taking out rent seekers and we're taking out owners that, that just take a portion of what we produce every day. So instead of that, instead of spending all that time producing for them, we're producing it uh, for ourselves. You have to recharge batteries daily. Yeah? I mean, so... How is how is that any different than any electrical system? I mean, what's your point? You have to feed coal into a coal plant daily, yeah, or oil, or or natural gas. They have to be fed daily by a source. Every system has drawbacks and, and benefits. I don't really know. We don't have the technology for batteries. Come on, you got to do better than that. If you're going to troll, at least come up with something clever. Something that's not that easily debunked. We don't have battery technology. We've had battery technology for like 100 years now. Enough that, that it could power cars even back then. But we went in a different direction. We used the combustion engine instead. And we... <laughs> Okay, we would not need a mass scale solar field to make it worth uh, with our grid system, make it work with our grid system. No, we don't. There's such a thing as, as distributed power supplies, where you have a whole lot of producers that, that, that are making the, the power locally, and then it's distributed in, in or it's, it's stored in a distributed system where you have batteries all over the place. And as, as things is, is, as energy is being produced faster than it's being used, those batteries are filling up. And then when it's not being produced, 
as fast as it's being used, those batteries are discharging. Uh, you can have a system like that. We have the technology. We have the technology. It's it's it, you know it's not even as hard as building the what was it the ten million dollar man? I don't even I never watched that stupid show. Oh, you already reported this troll. Yeah, it's such a this is such a weak troll. Like, do you think I'm gonna get mad that you think we don't have the technology? So what if it's a massive scale? What is our power system right now? But a, a massive grid system, very complex, much more complex than we would even need with renewable energy. Because with our current system, we are we are taking one source of energy, which is usually fossil fuels, but even with nuclear, and then we are turning turbines either through steam or or. I guess it's usually just through steam. Uh, we're heating things, and then there's a power loss there between that and, and converting it into energy and then sending that energy out over the grid. It's an incredibly inefficient system. Um, and it's also very complex as well, and it needs constant inputs that you don't need from a... a multi-input uh, renewable system. Oh, six million dollar man. <laughs> Which is like nothing these days. Like imagine spending six million dollars on a person. That's impossible. I mean, yeah. Fossil fuels is a lie. Imagine, okay. Fossil fuels is a colloquialism. It, I know that they, that, that most of the oil and coal and, and whatnot doesn't come from dinosaurs directly. Most of it comes from uh, single celled organisms like, like algae that, that died, you know, either over time or, or all very quickly um, and left a little bit of oil. But that doesn't matter. It's, we're, we know what we're talking about. You're just being pedantic and silly and not a very good troll. All bionic woman, yeah. I never watched either. Neither, for some reason, neither of those shows just never appealed to me. Uh, 1970s TV series. Yeah, that was a, that was a little bit before my time. <laughs> Imagine believing we use dinosaurs for fuel. Okay. Really? Come on. You can, I'm sure you can do better than that. Like, anyway, why don't you actually stick around? You might, might learn something yourself about how other people think. Let's continue on with, with Kropotkin. Constantly plying Inching between towards the end of the and chapter. London, only to export the crops of the greenhouses. Nowadays, in order to obtain that same crop of 500 bushels of potatoes, we must plow every year a surface of four acres, plant it, cultivate it, weed it, and so on. Whereas with the glass, even if we shall have to give perhaps to start half a day's work per square yard in order to build the greenhouse, we shall save afterwards at least one half and probably three quarters of the yearly labor required formerly. These are so again, he's going into these very minute details for the purpose of, of lending credence to it. He's, he's showing his work that he's actually he's not just saying, well, we can do that. And then people say, well, how do you know? And be like, well, I, I, I think we can do it. I just come on, look at it. No, he's actually going in and saying. You know, thus and such number of hours per square acre is what's needed to produce this amount of food to feed this amount of people on and on and on. So he's, he's trying to make it very realistic in, in the sort of uh, claims that he's making, because he knows that otherwise people are just going to say, well, you know, you didn't do the real math on it. You don't know what you're talking about uh, or, or things like fossil fuel is a lie that I, I can imagine his critics saying dumb stuff like that back in his day as well. Um, so yeah, I, I, I like that he's being very minute about the, the detail that he's going into and, and very deliberate in trying to make it uh, or, or trying to show uh, exactly what it would take to enact his vision because I, I'm sure he's anticipating already that, that he's going to have a lot of people that think his, his idea is just too idealistic uh, to ever work in, in the real world. So he's saying, no, look at, look at this. This can actually work. Here's the calculations. I've done it. These are facts results which everyone can verify himself and these facts are already a hint as to what man could obtain from the earth if he treated it with intelligence part five Good design in all the above we have reasoned upon what already withstood the test of experience 
intensive culture of the fields, irrigated meadows, and the hothouse, and finally, the kitchen garden under glass, are realities. Moreover, the tendency is to extend and to generalize these methods of culture, because they allow of obtaining more produce with less work and with more certainty. In fact, after having studied the most simple glass shelters of Guernsey, we affirm that, taking all in all, far less work is expended for obtaining potatoes under glass in April than in growing them in the open air, which requires digging a space four times as large, watering it, weeding it, etc. Work is likewise economized in employing a perfected tool or machine, even when an initial expense has to be incurred to buy the tool. Mm. Complete figures concerning the culture and common vegetables under glass are still wanting, this culture is of recent origin, and is only carried out on small areas. But we have already figures concerning the 50 years old culture of early season grapes, and these figures are conclusive. In the north of England, on the Scotch frontier, where coal only costs three shillings a ton at the pit's mouth, they have long since taken to growing hothouse grapes. 30 years ago, these grapes, ripe in January, were sold by the grower at 20 shillings per pound and resold at 40 shillings per pound for Napoleon III's table. Today, the same grower sells them at only 2 shillings 6 pennies per pound. He tells us so himself in a horticultural journal. The fall in the prices is caused by the tons and tons of grapes arriving in January to London and Paris. Thanks to the cheapness of coal and intelligent culture, grapes from the north travel now southwards in a contrary direction to ordinary fruit. They cost so little that in May, English and Jersey grapes are sold at one shilling eight pennies per pound by the gardeners. And yet this price, like that of 40 shillings 30 years ago, is only kept up by slack production. In March, Belgium grapes are sold at from six pennies to eight pennies, while in October grapes are cultivated in immense quantities under glass and with little artificial heating in the environs of London, are sold at the same price as grapes bought by the pound in the vineyards of Switzerland and the Rhine, which is to say for a few half pence. They still cost two-thirds too much, by reason of the excessive rent of the soil and the cost of installation and heating on which the gardener pays a formidable tribute to the manufacturer and the middleman. This being understood, we may say that it costs next to nothing to have delicious grapes under the latitude of and in our misty London in autumn. In one of our suburbs, for instance, a wretched glass and plaster shelter, nine feet ten inches long by six and one half feet wide, Resting against our cottage gave us about 50 pounds of grapes of an exquisite flavor in October for nine consecutive years. The crop came from a Hamburg vine stock six years old, and the shelter was so bad that the rain came through. At night, the temperature was always that of outside. It was evidently not heated, for it would have been useless as heating the street, and the care which was given was pruning the vine half an hour every year and bringing a wheelbarrow full of manure, which was thrown over the stalk of the vine planted in red clay outside the shelter. Ah, and this is, this is exactly the sort of thing, excuse me, exactly the sort of thing that uh, Bill Mollison, the, the founder, one of the founders of the permaculture principle, likes to talk about, or the permaculture philosophy, I should say, uh, the principle of, of doing the least action for the greatest yield or the greatest reward. So uh, this, this, this vine that he's, he's talking about requires very little effort to, to keep it going. You just tend to it a little bit uh, every year, like half an hour work. That's, that's negligible. You could, you could spend longer than that watering your plants. In fact, I do because I have, I mean, this is only a small fraction of the plants that I have. I, I spend more than that every week uh, just watering the, the house plants that I have. But it's things like that, that where, where permaculture really shines and can really um, mesh well as, as an addition to this sort of theory um, coming to fruition. Uh, so, so yeah, th these are, these are uh, the sorts of, th of things that, that, that Kropotkin was already trending towards in his thinking. Uh, and perhaps if he'd lived a, a century more, he would have, have uh, met up with the permaculturists and, and really fused it into to a great theory, uh, an even more robust theory. Uh, but with permaculture, a lot of the times what you're looking for are perennial crops. And perennial, uh, uh, an annual crop, which is, is most of what you eat, you know, peppers, tomatoes, um, not technically potatoes, but the way that they're grown is, is basically as an annual. Um, wheat, 
corn, these sorts of things, these are all annuals. They put out their seed every year, uh, and then they, the plant itself dies. It's, it's the, the next generation comes all from seed. Oh, Susie Foreman, good to see you. Uh, I'm doing well, how are you? Uh, we were just talking about uh, the final chapter of Peter Kropotkin's The Conquest of Bread, and it's on agriculture. So I was explaining that, that annual crops are, are most of the things you see in the produce aisle. Um, they put out their seed once a year, and then the plant dies back, and the next generation comes from the seed that it puts out. Now a perennial, you plant it one time, and then it lasts year after year. Uh, an apple tree will last 15, 20, or more years. You only plant it the one time. And you, the benefits of these sorts of, of plants are that you have to do less work. You know, you're not having to till the soil year after year. You couldn't till the soil. You know, imagine trying to till an apple orchard. That wouldn't work. You'd, you'd, you'd destroy the roots of your, your trees. It would defeat the entire purpose. Um, but it's a, 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 a little bit of work up front, but then you get rewards from it more and more and more. And that's the, that's the sort of thing that, that, that uh, permaculture principles can lead you to design systems that do this sorts of thing, the, the exact sort of thing that he just talked about in this last paragraph here. Cultivating plants that, that require little maintenance but give you uh, a yield year after year after, after year. There we go. On the other hand, if we estimate the amount of care given to the vine on the borders of the Rhine of Lake Lehman, the terrace is constructed stone. Oh, I'm so I'm so pleased to hear that you've uh, followed me and, and joined my my group on uh, my groups on Facebook. They're they're a lot of fun, and and for those of you that are unfamiliar, I, I run two groups on on Facebook. Um, one of those being Left Pod Posting, where we we tend to talk more about leftist podcasts uh but it you know we're pretty loose on the rules uh and then left signal boost which is for every other media so it's, it's a fun place to come hang out and, and learn about leftist creators share memes you know just build community that, that's what it's about it's a lot of fun so i'm i'm really happy that you're a part of that and i encourage everyone else to to do the same and if you're enjoying what you're seeing here to please follow as well all right, continuing on. Upon stone, on the slopes of the hills, the transport of manure, and also of earth, to the height of two or three hundred feet. We come to the conclusion that, on the whole, the expenditure of work necessary to cultivate vines is more considerable in Switzerland, or on the banks of the Rhine, than it is under the glass in London suburbs. This may seem paradoxical, because it is generally believed that vines grow of themselves in the south of Europe, and that the vine grower's work costs nothing. But gardeners and horticulturalists, far from contradicting us, confirm our assertions. The most advantageous culture in England is vine culture, wrote a practical gardener, editor of the English Journal of Horticulture in the 19th century. Prices speak eloquently for themselves, as we know. Translating these facts into communist language, we may assert that the man or woman who takes 20 hours a year from his leisure time to give some little care, very pleasant in the main, to two or three vine stalks sheltered by simple glass under any European climate, will gather as many grapes as their family and friends can eat, and that applies not only to vines, but to all fruit trees. The commune that will put the processes of intensive culture into practice on a large scale will have all possible vegetables, indigenous or exotic, and all desirable fruits without employing more than about 10 hours a year per inhabitant. In fact, nothing would be easier than to verify the above statements by direct experiment. Suppose 100 acres of light loam, such as we have at Worthing, are transformed into a number of market gardens, each one with its glass houses for the rearing of the seedlings and young plants. Suppose, also, the 50 more acres are covered with glass houses, and the organization of the whole is left to practical experienced French maraîchers and Guernsey and Worthing greenhouse gardeners. In basing the maintenance of these 150 acres on the Jersey average requiring the work of three men per acre under glass, which would make less than 8,600 hours of work a year, it would need about 1,300,000 hours for the 150 acres. 50 competent gardeners could give five hours a day to this work, and the rest would be simply done by people who, without being gardeners by profession, would soon learn how to use a spade and to handle the plants. But this work would yield at least, we have seen it in the preceding chapter, all necessities and articles of luxury in the way of fruit and vegetables for at least 40,000 or 50,000 people. Let us admit that among this number, 
there are 13,500 adults willing to work at the kitchen garden. Then each one would have to give 100 hours a year distributed over the whole year. These hours of work would become hours of recreation, spent among friends and children in beautiful gardens, more beautiful probably than those of the legendary Semiramis. This is the balance sheet of the labor to be spent in order to be able to eat a satiety fruit which we are deprived of today, and to have vegetables in abundance, so scrupulously rationed out by the house. Uh, that's just what I was talking about. So with, with all these middlemen, these rent seekers, these owners, uh, being cut out of the, the equation... And, and with you needing to do, uh, cutting out all the labor that it used to take to satisfy their, you know, quote unquote needs, um, you have a lot more leisure time to, to do whatever you feel like. Uh, as he said, you build, build beautiful gardens, you know, uh, do whatever you pursue, whatever project you would like. That, that seems like a pretty good bargain to me, a, a pretty good trade-off, you know, uh, trading off the, the current system for one that, that empowers a whole lot more people to live their highest and best life. His wife, when she has to reckon each half penny, which must go to enrich capitalists and landowners. If only humanity had the consciousness of what it can, and if that consciousness only gave it the power to will. If it only knew that cowardice of the spirit is the rock on which all revolutions have stranded until now. Part 6 We can easily perceive the new horizons opening before the social revolution. Each time we speak of revolution, the face of the worker who has seen children wanting food darkens, and he asks, What of bread? Will there be sufficient if everyone eats according to his appetite? What if the peasants, ignorant tools of the reaction, starve our towns, as the black bands did in France in 1793? What shall we do? Let them do their worst. The large cities will have to do without them. At what, then, should the hundreds of thousands of workers who are asphyxiated today in small workshops and factories be employed on the day they regain their liberty? Will they continue to shut themselves up in factories after the revolution? Will they continue to make luxurious toys for export when they see their stock or corn getting exhausted, meat becoming scarce, and vegetables disappearing without being replaced? Evidently not. They will leave the town and go into the fields, aided by machinery which will enable the weakest of us to put a shoulder to the wheel. They will carry revolution into previously enslaved culture as they will have carried it into institutions and ideas. Hundreds of acres will be covered with glass and men and women with delicate fingers will foster the growth of young plants. Hundreds of other acres will be plowed by steam, improved by manures, or enriched by artificial soil obtained by the pulverization of rocks. Happy crowds of occasional laborers will cover these acres with crops, guided in the work and experiments partly by those who know agriculture, but especially by the great and practical spirit of a people roused from the long slumber and illumined by that bright beacon, the happiness of all. And in two or three months, the early crops will receive the most pressing wants and provide food for a people who, after so many centuries of expectation, will at least be able to appease their hunger and eat according to their appetite. In the meanwhile, popular genius, the genius of a nation which revolts and knows its wants, will work at experimenting with new processes of culture that we already catch a glimpse of, and that we only need the baptism of experience to become universal. Light will be experimented with, that unknown agent of culture which makes barley ripen in 45 days under the latitude of Yakutsk. Light, concentrated or artificial, will rival heat in hastening the growth of plants. A musho of the future will invent a machine to guide the rays of the sun and make them work, so that we shall no longer seek sun heat stored in coal in the depths of the earth. They will experiment- Wow. Now that's a good prediction. Uh, a machinery will be created to guide the rays of the sun so that we no longer have to rely on the stored sunlight of, of coal. I mean, for, for one thing, that's amazing that they, they, they knew that even back then, that, that these fossilized fuels are, are really just uh, the product of stored sunlight. Um, I didn't realize that, that that was even known at that time. But look at, look at him predicting solar panels. That's pretty cool. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure if he were alive today, he'd be all about these, these new appropriate technologies, helping uh, liberate the, the common worker even more. Experiment the watering of the soil with cultures of microorganisms, a rational idea conceived but yesterday, 
which will permit watering of soil with microorganisms. It's something practiced today uh, um, by, by many permaculture practitioners uh, in, in things like uh, compost tea, where, you know, you just take the, uh, like you take a compost bin and you, and you set it in a, you have it set up as a tub with, it, with drainage at the bottom, and then the liquid that comes out the bottom um, these, these concentrates of, of both uh, healthy microorganism soil ecology, as, as well as the nutrients that come with it, you, you put that back onto your, your crops. So that, that literally is something that, that is done today. That's amazing. Uh, compost tea. Or you can do it through worm castings as well. You put worm castings in a bucket of water overnight, and it lends all the, the beneficial organisms to the, the, sp the spray, and you can... Uh, use it to, to help treat diseases as well uh, on your crops. It's, it's a good foliar spray, and it's a way to, to directly feed the, the leaves as well. So that's really cool. He's got some good predictions so far at the end. Permit us to give to the soil those little living beings necessary to feed the rootlets to decompose. Oh, and this is, the, this is the beginning of ecology. I don't think ecology was even a formalized field until, like, what, the 70s? When did ecology come into being? Because it was not recent. And he's talking about it right now. Oh, okay. So there, there were uh, the beginning whispers of e ecological ideas as far, as far back as Hippocrates and Aristotle um, on the way that nature interacts with one another. And, and it's a very complex system of, of knowledge, so it's hard to really pin it down as to when it started, it looks like. But the modern understanding, I think, I think my wife was watching the old Howard Dean video where he did the scream in the other room. That just got really intense for a second there. Oh uh, boy, I'm not, I'm not seeing a good formalization of it as a science. But it looks like perhaps at his time, these, these ideas were, were actually being starting to be formalized. As, as a as a separate science from or a separate branch of biology interest cool anyway that, 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 that was cool to hear uh, him talking about ecology and the, the, the plants de being dependent on a whole range of microorganisms found in the soil that's that's cool then assimilate the component parts of the soil they will experiment but let us stop here or we shall enter into the realm of fancy let us remain in the reality of acquired facts, with the processes of culture and, and use. Again, he's, he's trying to, to turn you back from believing that he's he's too uh, pie in the sky or, or overly optimistic in his theories. He's trying to ground things very, very... And I think he does a pretty good job of it, especially at the end here with all these... Um, what may be seen as, as very dry and unimportant uh, facts and figures was was very important in his time i'm sure to to prove the the viability of what he said applied on a large scale and already victorious in the struggle against industrial competition we can give ourselves ease and luxury in return for agreeable work the near future will show what is practical in the processes that recent scientific discoveries give us a glimpse of let us limit ourselves at present to opening up the new path that consists in the study of the needs of man and the means of satisfying them. The only thing that may be wanting to the revolution is the boldness of initiative. With our minds already narrowed in our youth and enslaved by the past in our mature age, we hardly dare to think. If a new idea is mentioned before venturing on an opinion of our own... Boy, and isn't, you know, isn't that the, the case today? You know, all, all, all it takes is, is for enough of us to believe in the same thing and, and we literally can just decide to change it um, but but it takes that that daring to, to dream beyond the the confines of current accepted thought and theory and and today that that is uh, still a capitalist framework at least in in my country of the US but yeah I think I think just starting people, on this journey of, of going beyond what is to what is possible um, and showing them in very concrete ways that it, that it can be possible and starting to really put these systems together 
um, I think that more than anything will will move the needle, <laughs> move things forward, give us any chance of getting a, a critical mass of, of people doing this where real change can be affected for a lot of people. Brown, we consult musty books a hundred years old to know what the ancient master. <laughs> Isn't that funny that we are now consulting musty books a hundred years old? And this is coming up on a hundred and. Uh, 130 years. I think it's just four more years. It'll be 130 year old book. I can't remember if it was 1894 or 95 that came out. Just thought on the subject. It is not food that will fail if boldness of thought and initiative are not wanting to the revolution. Of all the great days of the French Revolution, the most beautiful, the greatest, was the one in which delegates who had come from all parts of France to Paris worked all with the spade to plane the grounds of the Champ de Mars preparing it for the fete of the Federation. That day, France was united. Animated by the new spirit, she had a vision of the future in working in common of the soil. And it will again be by the working in common of the soil that the enfranchised societies will find their unity and will obliterate the hatred and oppression which has hitherto divided them. Henceforth, able to conceive solidarity, that immense power which increases man's energy and creative forces a hundredfold, a new society will march to the conquests of the future with all the vigor of youth, ceasing to produce for unknown buyers and looking in its midst for needs and tastes to be satisfied. Society will liberally assure the life and ease of each of its members, as well as that moral satisfaction which work give when freely chosen and freely accomplished, and the joy of living without encroaching on the life of others. Inspired by a new daring, born of the feeling of solidarity, all will march together to the conquest of the high joys of knowledge and artistic creation. A society thus inspired will fear neither dissensions within nor enemies without. To the coalitions of the past, it will oppose a new harmony, the initiatives of each and all, the daring which springs from the awakening of a people's genius. Before such an irresistible force, conspiring kings will be powerless. Nothing will remain for them but to bow before it, and to harness themselves to the chariot of humanity rolling towards new horizons opened up by the social revolution. End of chapter 17 End of The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin We did it! Wow. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. What a journey You can this find more been. Audible Anarchist on YouTube. Thank you. Thank you again to, to all the various guests that I've had on to help me tackle this book, this this book that I, I still find so much, whoops, I still find so much relevance in. Uh, man, I, I don't think I could have done it nearly as well without you. I, I, I know that that's absolutely a fact. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you to all the, the viewers that have, that have hung on through stream after stream. Uh, coming through this this thought process with me and and helping to bring these ideas into uh modern times and into modern ways of thinking um i really appreciate that too so yeah there you have it the conquest of bread by peter kropotkin one of the foundational texts of anarcho-communist thinking um still remains as one of my favorite books like even after reading it again and having read a bunch of stuff since then still is, is definitely up there. I, I like his vision of the future. I really like the idea of investing revolution in revolutionaries, not in bureaucrats, and, and just relying on them to dole out everything uh, fairly and peaceably. Um, I, I feel that, that spreading power as, as far and wide as possible is not only the most just thing, but the, the best guard against any one person uh, hoarding enough power or resources um, or any kind of influence to have an outsized source, uh, outsized influence on any of the workings of, of um, political life or, or um, just everyday life. Uh, so, so, I mean, that, that's, that's why I follow anarchy more than anything else because I just I feel that's the, the right thing to do 
spread power out um, and help empower as many people as possible. Uh, yeah. Wow. This is good. Yeah, this has been quite the journey, as I said. Um, yeah, what do you guys think about it? Uh, those of you that have, have caught uh, a chapter or two, um, do, do you feel more hopeful about this sort of a world being able to, to come into being? Uh, do you feel that he still was being too optimistic? Do you feel that we, we still need a, a centralized force to guard against uh, enemies, uh, foreign and domestic, so to speak? Um, yeah. Did he make you think of anything you didn't uh, anticipate? Did he, did he go to any places that you didn't think we were going to go? Um, I mean, I, I certainly didn't remember the part where he, he talked that much about uh, his predictions about ecology, about power generation, about uh, all these things that, that literally ended up coming true. Um, yeah, that was, that was cool. Um, yeah. All right. Well, uh, with that, I, I would like to show you... Uh, let's go... Here, actually, first, let's go to this view so we can see it a little bit better. And I'm going to show you. Oh, got to reload that page after the power went out. Everything <laughs> went off for me. Uh, this is a really great site. It's called Pod News. And almost every podcast that is in existence today is cataloged at Pod News. All you have to do is search for it. Uh, here is mine. And the cool thing about it is. Instead of giving like just one link to Apple Podcasts and, and just hoping that enough people have that particular app or enough people are interested that, that they, you know, if they use a different player like Spotify, that they will take your name and go search for it on Spotify instead. Instead of having all these different platforms listed, you know, so you have like, you know, all these different links, um, Apple, Google, Spotify, having to, having to share each one of those individually, this puts everything in one place. So you, you, you find a podcast that you like, and then you find the player that you like to use to listen on. Uh, so I take the audio from these streams, and I put them out as a podcast through Anchor. Anchor is, is the, the service that I use. And then that automatically puts it out on Spotify, on Google Podcasts, on Apple Podcasts, and a bunch of other much smaller ones. Yeah, you can see them all there. These are all the places that my podcast is now available. So if you see your player, all you have to do is, is go to Pod News, type in bread underscore theory, uh, which is the name of my podcast as well, and it will take you to the links uh, so that you can add my podcast uh, to your uh followed podcast list or however however it's organized on your podcast app of choice um so it's just a really it's a really cool resource uh you can even find out the rss feed um you can click on that uh, there's actually a tool as well usually uh where you can oh, here we go if you if you don't see your particular podcast app and and you happen to have a podcast you happen to use a podcast app where you can add podcasts uh, for it to follow because a lot of these are just auto generated you know like like player fm it will uh hook on to various podcast rss feeds usually usually it finds it through like apple podcasts so if it pops up on apple podcasts it will take its rss feed and and just add it as 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 a podcast that you can find on it so if you have a particular podcast where you can add rss feeds to it um you can go to validate this podcast rss feed and you can find the 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 actual uh unique rss feed for say my podcast and potentially add it to your podcast player yourself if you don't see yours there uh, but but really the 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 important takeaway is that you 
go check out the podcast. Um, it's a it's a different way of experiencing these sorts of things. I always edit the audio as well, so it's not just going to be the the raw feed. I edit it for for both the um, YouTube version of these streams and then also for the podcast as well. So a little bit different experience, um, maybe a little bit better if you are say. Uh, wanting something to listen to while you're jogging or, or doing housework or just uh, have a long road trip ahead of you, something like that. Um, perhaps a podcast is, is the right medium for you. So I just wanted to put that out there, that this is another way you can support my work and, and support my uh, uh, the stuff that I put out, which is, which is my work. Uh, another way you can interact with my content. You just go to Pod News. Search for uh, bread underscore theory and then look for your favorite app and it'll link you right to it. I'll give you an example right now. If so if I want to look at, at Apple Podcasts, I just click on that link and here you go. Here's bread theory on Apple Podcasts. And having brought that up, one of the best ways to boost my stats in Apple Podcasts algorithm is for you to go there and give me a five-star review. So I'd very much appreciate uh, if you just pop over to Apple Podcasts and, and, and search for it there, or just go through that pod news and find it that way. Uh, but anyway, if you go to Apple Podcasts and give me a, a um, five-star review and, and or a five-star rating and, and perhaps a, a review, it doesn't have to be a long review, just like one sentence, what you thought about it. That really helps boost my stats in the algorithm helps other people find my content. Um, and yeah, it, it just, it helps bring these ideas to more ears. So I really appreciate that as well. Okay, I think we've done it. I think we've finally finished this book. You know what? I think I'm gonna give you over to Ali Yoshu. And, and thank you, Ali, for, for being um, probably my, my most loyal follower so far. I really appreciate your contributions to uh, the stream. And I also like your content a lot as well. So, and there we go, I'm gonna start the raid. Lectem everybody, thank you so much for taking this journey with me. And look forward to starting the next book next Friday with you.